everybody. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Teja. I, it is my pleasure to introduce Jack Bishop, who's uh, one of the best nuclear, uh, young nuclear physics researchers I've had the privilege to work with. Uh, Jack uh, completed his, uh, both his undergrad and graduate degrees from the University of Birmingham in the UK. Uh, he finished his PhD in 2018 with uh, Professor Zani Kakalova and Martin Freer. Uh, so during his thesis work, he spent a lot of time uh, working on the study uh, on studying the properties of the Hoyle state. Uh, he moved to the Cyclotron Institute at Texas A&M University to work with uh, Professor Grigory Ragachov, where he could not escape the Hoyle state, uh, which was the focus of the first few experiments that he conducted uh, with the newly commissioned uh, Texas Time Prediction Chamber there. It was then that he also was able to uh, unable to escape me as I was a PhD student at the same time in the group. Um, so the, uh, this work included measuring the absolute value of the extremely rare uh, direct decay components of the whole state uh, for the first time using the beta decay, beta delayed particle delay, as well as uh, investigating uh, unusual fmof like states near the threshold in uh, carbon-12. Uh, he then also led a uh, project working at Ohio University Edwards lab to measure the impact of neutron upscattering on the triple alpha reaction rate uh, that he will tell us all about today. Uh, so it was for this uh, work and other advances in uh, nuclear spectroscopy with TPCs that he was awarded the inaugural EFRIB Achievement Award for Early Career Researchers in 2021. He is now uh, an assistant research scientist at the Cyclotron Institute, uh, where he's working on the next generation upgrade to a Texas active target called uh, TIBAT, which is Texas Birmingham active target. Uh, without further ado, take it away, Jeff. Great, thanks a lot, Teja. Share my screen. Okay. So yeah, thanks a lot for the introduction. So yeah, hi, I'm Jack Bishop, and I'm gonna be talking to you today about neutron upscattering enhancement of the triple alpha process. So here's an overview of what the talk is going to look like. I'm going to start but with a little bit of a gentle introduction. Um, the, no, there's a bit of a mixture in the audience of people who may be more familiar with some of these terms. Um, for those who aren't, don't worry, I'm going to walk through and uh, try and explain as best as possible these concepts so you don't get too lost. So for those who uh, are perhaps undergraduate or graduate students who for whom this isn't quite their area of expertise. Uh, what I actually have is I have a few of these help blocks throughout my talk. Um, so if you look for these little blocks that look a little bit like this, these will try and provide some sort of context to any terminology or ideas. So if unfortunately for whatever reason you start to become slightly lost during the talk, then please you know try and keep listening and find these little help blocks and hopefully it will sort of uh, put you back on towards the right track. Um, but if there isn't a term or you, you just need an explanation, then feel free to to uh, interject or we can talk about it later. Okay, so let's start by talking about the triple alpha process. So this is a fairly well-known process. So the triple alpha process is a way to overcome the A equals five and A equals eight mass gap in nuclear synthesis. So what this uh, requires is the fusing of three alpha particles to form carbon 12. So this is a two-stage process. So we have the two alpha particles which come together and they form the brilliant mate nucleus, which only has a lifetime of around 10 to the minus 16 seconds. Because the brilliant mate nucleus is unbound by 92 keV, this means that it just breaks back apart again into two alpha particles. So this is a dynamic process and we end up with some equilibrium concentration uh, depending on it, the exact uh, densities and temperatures, but this is around you know, 10 to the nine um, helium uh, particles for every one brilliant mate. So what we can have in the triple alpha process is we can have the third alpha particle that comes in while we're still in this uh, brilliant mate um, unbound state, and we can form excited states in carbon-12, um, which then overcomes this A equals 5, A equals ice mass gap. Now, there is a very well-known state in uh, carbon-12, which uh, Tejo alluded to earlier, known as the Hoyle state. So the presence of this zero plus state, which is 7.65 MeV in excitation energy, actually enhances the reaction rate by several orders of magnitude. And this is known as the Hoyle state. So what's really important in able to actually generate uh, carbon-12 and then go on to further uh, elements is that uh, this isn't the final step of the process. So once we populated the Hoyle state, what we actually need is we need for the, the Hoyle state to de-excite and give away some of its energy so that it ends up in the ground state of carbon-12. Because 99.9% .9 of the time, it actually has enough energy. It's over the alpha decay threshold that it just breaks back apart again 
into Brilliant Mate plus uh, Alpha Particle, uh, and you end up basically right back at square one. So the really important thing is this 0.04% branching ratio, which allows some sort of decay, and then we end up with carbon-12 in the ground state. So for those who uh, aren't quite familiar with the idea of a resonance, uh, you, can, you can think of the analogy of uh, singing in, at a wine glass. So the resonance is where the system has exactly the right frequency or the energy that you have some sort of very huge response. So all nuclei with a little asterisk have an infinite series of these resonances. And there's just some particular configuration of the protons and neutrons inside of carbon-12 that means that this particular energy is very good for creating um, carbon-12 through the triple alpha process. So when we actually look at the reaction rate for the triple alpha process, uh, it is given by this. So what we rely on is the, uh, the, width, the alpha width times by this radiative width, uh, which corresponds to the, um, when we end up with carbon-12 in the ground state, there's some sort of temperature dependence. And what we see is that because the uh, alpha width is so much larger than the radiative decay width, what this really means is the reaction rate is uh, almost entirely directly proportional to this radiative decay width here. And there are a series of different ways that the, uh, this can actually happen. Here I've noted uh, two gamma rays. So this is a zero plus state. We get a gamma ray emission to the first excited state, which is a two plus, And then we have another gamma uh, decay down to the ground state and it's nice and safe. Um, we can also have uh, electron-positron pair production, which is uh, a lot smaller, and the, the width of that is um, about 60 times less than the gamma to K width. And for those who uh, aren't quite familiar with this, so the uh, capital gamma here is the width of the resonance. So you can think about this as being inversely related to the lifetime, and in some way this shows you uh, how, how you should think about what the branching ratio is. So you populate the state, and it's very unstable. You want to think about how it's going to decay uh, back into its constituents particles. And this is what this uh, capital gamma here gives you. OK, so where does neutron upscattering come into this? So the idea of neutron upscattering is that there are additional ways that we can actually go from this carbon-12 Hoyle state down to the ground state of carbon-12. So as I mentioned, if we look uh, on the y-axis here, we have uh, sort of excitation. So we can have the two gamma ray decays through the two plus intermediate. We can have electron positron pair, which jumps from the zero plus Hoyle state to the ground state. But what we can actually have in a, um, an astrophysical environment where we have a very high density of neutrons is we can have a low energy neutron coming in while the Hoyle state is uh, just, be just before it has a chance to uh, fly apart. The neutron comes in, it interacts with the Hoyle state, and it actually takes away a large amount of energy in the form of kinetic energy of the neutron. So you get a low energy neutron come in, a high energy neutron come out. And what this actually means is that then, uh, depending on exactly how much energy is taken, the Hoyle state it has another way to de excite. So we can end up either in the two plus state, and then you just have a gamma ray to end up in the ground state, or you can go all the way from the Hoyle state down to the ground state. So what we really want to think about here is this additional probe and how this is affecting this radiative to decay mechanism, which as we saw is really driving the rate of the triple alpha process. And the way that we want to kind of think about this is um, we use a, a quantum mechanical idea of time reversal symmetry. So on the right hand side, uh, what we have is uh, what if we were observing this in star, we have three alpha particles come together in addition with a low energy neutron. And what we see is we see carbon-12, which is produced basically at rest, and then we have a high energy neutron that is going to be coming out. And what we can do is we can actually think about what if, uh, if we look at the time reversal of this particular situation. So if we look in our time reversal mirror, what we see is that all the particles move backwards. And in this situation, we have a high energy neutron coming in, we, it hits carbon-12, and we have three alpha particles flying out, and then we have a low energy neutron coming. And using the idea of time reversal symmetry, then quantum mechanically, we can actually relate these two processes back to each other. And we actually have a hope of being able to study the left-hand side reaction experimentally, whereas you know, firing three alpha particles together and getting a low energy neutron to come in at exactly the same time is never gonna happen on a lab on Earth. Okay, so the question that we wanna answer then is how likely is this particular reaction to take place? And in nuclear physics, when we try and uh, look at these particular things, what we think about is cross-section. So the cross-section is the way of telling us how likely this particular reaction is to take place. 
And in fact, uh, the presence of resonances actually make these reactions much more likely to happen at a certain energy, as I mentioned with the Hoyle states earlier. So what we can do is we can say, okay, why don't we have a look at the current uh, existing experimental data? And this is what was done um, a couple of years ago by Murray Beard and collaborators. So on the left-hand side here, we have uh, the, uh, inelast the inelastic scattering cross-sections for neutrons, where we're going either from the ground state to the two-plus state that's shown in the red. And you can see that there's actually pretty good data for this all the way from the threshold up to a reasonably high energy. Um, but if we look at the inelastic scattering for neutrons from the ground state to the Hoyle state, we only have a few data points up here, about 16 to 22 MeV. And the region that is astrophysically interesting for us is around the threshold way down here. And there's no data. So that's, that's obviously pretty bad. So what uh, Beard and collaborators decided to do was the best thing you can do in this scenario is you can use uh, the idea of house of Feshbach and you can perform a house of Feshbach calculation that gives you some you know, order of magnitude idea of exactly what the cross section is going to do as a function of energy. So this is what's shown on the left-hand side in green. And you can see that as you go above the threshold, it rises fairly rapidly. And you, know, you, you have quite large error bars. You reach some sort of peak around 10 MeV in the lab, and then it kind of goes back down again. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to uh, actually measure this uh, astrophysically interesting region and see for ourselves exactly how important it is. And the reason for that is that if you actually take these cross sections and you go through, um, what, what you can then do is you can use the idea of these, um, the, you can use the cross sections for the inelastic scattering for neutrons to actually work out what the influence of this neutron upscattering phenomena is going to be on the triple alpha reaction rates. And there's actually a few different ways, as I said before, that it can actually start to contribute. So there's neutrons, which can also contribute, yes, but there's also protons which can come in and do exactly the same thing here. And actually, you can see that for the protons around the threshold, there are actually data um, going basically all the way right down to the thresholds. So what this paper then did is it took uh, the House of Feshbach calculations where they didn't have the experimental data, the experimental data for the protons where they did, and then they looked and said, OK, if we have this neutron upscattering phenomena for a density of 10 to 6 grams per cubic centimeter, of either neutrons or protons, then by what factor does the triple alpha reaction rate increase? Okay. And as I said before, there are actually two different components for that. There's the Hoyle state to the two plus, and there's the Hoyle state all the way down to the ground states. So on the left-hand side here is the factor increase of the triple alpha reaction rate for this density as a function of uh, the temperature. So this is just in gigakelvin for those who aren't familiar with T9. So what we see is that at very, very small temperatures, the, uh, the most important contribution is actually from the neutrons, you know, that perhaps not surprisingly, you know, they don't have the, the Coulomb uh, force when they come in and scatter, so they're going to dominate at uh, these lower temperatures. And the really remarkable thing from this paper is that what we see is that uh, between the two of them, you see almost a factor of 170 times increase in the triple alpha reaction rate. So this is saying that if you have a density of 10 to the 6 grams per cubic centimeter of neutrons, then you're creating carbon, you know, a factor of 100 times higher. And I think people would say that, you know, we, we feel like we understand the triple alpha reaction rate fairly well, particularly at lower temperatures. So this is a, a really surprising result. So uh, as you go towards the, the higher temperatures, you see that the protons start to contribute, but the contribution is, is much smaller, but still fairly remarkable. So what we really need here is we need this experimental data, which is really verifying these hazel feshback calculations. And for that, we need a very special type of detector. So to summarize this, uh, this part of the uh, neutron upscattering, so this neutron upscattering is contributing to how well the Hoyle state ends up in the stable form of carbon-12, which directly drives the alpha burning stage in the triple alpha process. And what we want to do is we want to measure the time reverse reaction. So what we do is we're going to fire neutrons at carbon-12. We're going to break it apart into three alpha particles. And we want to measure the cross-section, i.e. how likely is that to happen. And what we see from the model predictions is that we expect that this cross-section is very large. And therefore, the contribution of neutron upscattering is going to be huge. And as I mentioned, there's no experimental data. Um, so uh, the approach that we decided to use uh, was using a TPC. So I'm going to explain a little bit now about what, the, uh, what a TPC is and uh, talk about our particular TPC tech set. 
So TPC stands for a time projection chamber. And the basic idea is that we have a large volume and we fill it with some particular type of gas. And as charged particles are passing through the gas, what they're going to do is they're going to lose energy and they create electron ion pairs along the path of the gas. So these electrons are sort of just sitting there uh, as the particle passes through and eventually over time they recombine. But what we actually want to do in this scenario is we place an electric field. And if we place it up, then that's such that the electrons are then drifted down uniformly with a constant velocity. And uh, in the uh, GIF on the screen, what we then do is we measure those electrons as they hit some sort of position sensitive detector. And what you can see is the, the red line is kind of uh, showing the single path of the uh, purple ion. And what we can do in addition is actually, if we look at the arrival time of these electrons, then that gives us an idea of what the height is in three dimensions. So the two dimensional position sensitivity gives us a sort of a top-down view and time projection gives us the height. And in this way, we can get a full 3D image of all of the charged particles that are passing through our time projection chamber. And that's the basic idea. So our particular uh, iteration of this is uh, known as Texas, which TechSat, which is the Texas Active Target Time Projection Chamber. So the typical sensitive area is 224 by 240 millimeters and has a height of 130 millimeters. So this, this isn't a particularly huge thing. Um, and the way that we uh, read out the, um, uh, the, where the electrons are laying is using the Micromegas device, and I'll come to that in a second. So for this, we have 1,024 channels, which gives us a position resolution of around 1.5 millimeters in the beam direction. So in addition to this, we have uh, additional components uh, known as gas electron multipliers or GEMS. And the idea of this is that they provide us additional gain. So particularly in the scenarios where we have very low, uh, very low ionizing particles, they don't produce many of these electrons along the way. So what this means is that if you want to have a good signal to be able to reconstruct your tract well, then you need to have a large gain so that your signal size is going to end up large. And all of this is time to get tied together with the uh, general electronics for TPCs known as GET. So what we do is we digitize the waveforms for each 1,024 of these uh, channels. So then that gives us the uh, time component um, so we can get the height. In addition, what we have is we have an ancillary uh, silicon and cesium iodide telescope wall. So this is a CAD on the right-hand side. So the beam comes through this little hole here. Uh, we have a little ionization chamber. Uh, in the case of charged particles, you can see exactly what's coming through and you can do beam ID. And then uh, the kind of really boring thing about a TPC is that you know most of it's just really empty volume. Um, so where this red area here is where we're filled with our gas and then the electrons are drifted onwards and then read out by these electronics. So this is what it looks like in real life. And as I said, it kind of looks boring when you look at it like this because it's basically just a, a big uh, area full of gas. Um, and uh, so the way that uh, we get these 3D tracks, as I said, is uh, we get we have some electric field, which is going to drift these electrons to some sort of position sensitivity. And this kind of gives you an idea in our particular scenario of how exactly it's going to happen. So electrons come through, you look at the amplitude of the signals along the way, and you have some sort of pixelization, and then that gives you the track. So for the micromegas, um, this is a, a very popular technique for uh, providing uh, position sensitive readout of these electrons. So if we zoom in, what we actually have is uh, as these electrons are drifted towards the sensitive region, uh, we have a very high electric field um, between the micro mesh and the readout pads. So around 128 microns, you have a voltage of 500 volts, something like that. And this is enough that as the electron comes in, it's accelerated and it starts to create a Townsend avalanche. So you get a large number of electrons. So all we're really doing is we're amplifying our signal. So we have one electron come in, we'll have maybe a thousand electrons coming out. So when we actually look at our signal inside of our electronics, it's a lot larger and we can pick it out above the, the thermal noise. So uh, there's a slightly complicated um, segmentation inside of TechSat. Uh, this was the first iteration and we only had you know, 1,024 channels, but we wanted to cover quite a large area. Um, but the, the important take home is that in the central area, we have um, much better um, pixels. So we have a 1.75 by 3.5 millimeter pad as we call them. 
Um, and then as we go into the side regions, so sort of looking in the, the reaction plane, uh, we actually have to uh, connect multiple of these channels together. And we call these strips and chains. And then using the timing, we can actually do a few uh, clever techniques to still get the perfect track back together, even though we're reading out lots of channels simultaneously. And in this particular configuration, uh, we actually use thick gems, which are actually 1.25 millimeters thick, and they give us an additional gain of a factor of 20 in the same way that the micromakers do. Okay, so the big question is, I'm telling you about a time projection chamber, but the, 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 the important question should be, why do we bother with the time projection chamber? And it really comes down to when we're performing study with these radioactive ion beams, we end up with very low intensities. So if we wanted a beam of uh, helium-4, for instance, you can just put on a helium gas bottle, you can send it through your LINAC, your accelerator, and everything's nice, and you can, uh, you know, you can get basically whatever uh, intensity your target can take. But when we're dealing with radioactive ion beams, the way that we actually generate these, if we do them online, is we have one primary beam colliding with uh, some sort of production target, and then we have the secondary beam coming out. And when you do this, you get a corresponding loss of intensity. So for some of the experiments that we're dealing with, rather than you know, 10 to the 12 particles per second, we can really go down to around 500 particles per second, and we really want to make sure that every ion counts here. So we need to make sure that we're optimizing our statistics. And the way that we can do this with the time projection chamber is that we can actually max maximize the target thickness. So if you look at the effective target thickness of the target gas inside of the time projection chamber, it's actually, it's actually very thick in comparison to where if you did this with a solid target experiment. And we can actually do this without any loss of uh, energy resolution. And the second way that time projection chambers actually maximize the statistics is that we're really maximizing the geometric efficiency. So if we have a reaction which is taking place right in the middle of the gas, but it doesn't matter in which direction the particle is going to go, we're going to see the reaction tracks going out. So we're maximizing the geometric efficiency. And uh, this is why TPCs are particularly useful for radioactive ion beams. And in this uh, very specific case, uh, another reason it's very useful is that they can also have extremely low energy thresholds. So as we'll come to later, uh, with this particular case that we're looking at, the energy of these alpha particles can be very low. Um, and actually in the past, we've managed to study alpha particles as low as maybe 20 keV. And uh, you can still read those out perfectly well with the time projection chamber. But if you were to use a silicon uh, detector, then you know sometimes that wouldn't even get through the dead layer of the silicon detector. So really a time projection chamber with the extremely low energy thresholds are the only way that you can really tackle this. So the aims of the TPC is we want to explore and demonstrate the, the capabilities of time projection chambers to study these light nuclear structure and reactions relevant to astrophysics. And we've actually done a huge variety of different experiments over the years with TechSat. Um, so we've done all sorts of uh, thick target and inverse kinematics elastic scattering experiments, um, uh, which are listed here. Uh, we've even, uh, a couple of years ago, built a uh, neutron detector, which sits directly behind of the uh, Texas Active Target Time Projection Chamber called TexNUT, where we can pick up the neutrons uh, in coincidence with the actual track from uh, Texat itself, which was very powerful. We've performed direct fusion measurements. We've done a, uh, some attempts at Trojan horse methods. We've looked at transfer reactions. We've even done beta delay particle decay inside. Um, but when I'm going to talk to you to get, to, about today is about neutron induced reactions. So just summarizing the, the strengths of text at TPC. So these time projection chambers allow us to study the charged particles in a gas volume. And a combination of the pixelation and the time for the signal to arrive gives us full 3D tracks. And in addition, actually looking at the amplitude of this signal, i.e. how many electrons we're picking up, can also give us an idea of the energy loss of the particle itself. And with a very high electric field, it gives us a large gain that, so that we can take a few hundred electrons and still see a very good signal. And uh, people often say that it's a new and exciting detector technology. It's not really super new, so I kind of replaced this with the word resurgent. Um, and it's TPCs are seeing uh, more and more exposure in uh, nuclear physics over the, the past few years. OK, so let's come to the actual experiments itself. 
So in this particular case, one uh, key thing to bear in mind is that uh, one of the strengths that TPCs can actually have is uh, the so-called active target approach. So here, this is where the gas that we place inside of the time projection chamber is simultaneously the nuclear target, and it's also the readout mechanism. So what we want to study is we want to study the inelastic scattering of neutrons off of carbon-12 to make uh, to end up with three alpha particles. So inelastic neutron scattering to the whole state. So here we obviously need some sort of target that has carbon in it. And actually, it turns out that CO2 is a really good gas for uh, TPCs. Um, so what we do in this particular case is we fill the uh, Texat TPC with CO2 gas. And in this scenario, we uh, actually go to a relatively low pressure because of the low energy of the alpha particles that are coming out. So we go to 50 tor CO2 gas, um, and we want to measure this particular reaction. Now, unfortunately for us at uh, the Cyclotron Institute at Texas A&M, we don't have uh, very lovely neutron beams. Um, so here we went to the Edwards Accelerator Lab at Ohio University, and we're incredibly grateful for them and all the support that they gave us during the experiment. And what they uh, produced for us was a very beautiful sort of quasi and monoenergetic neutron beam. So the schematic for the experiment is uh, shown on the right-hand side. So we start with a deutron beam from the accelerator. And as I said before, you can start with a very high intensity of uh, primary beam. So here we have around 10 to the 13 particles per second of uh, deuterium. And this deuterium is then fed into a deuteron uh, gas cell, which is filled with deuterium. So this is eight centimeters long, which is actually you know, relatively long, uh, all things considered. And as the deuterons collide with one another you, uh, from the DDN reaction, this actually produces a very nice quasi monoenergetic uh, beam of neutrons, which is uh, sort of focused in the forward direction. So to get rid of uh, the kinematics of the neutrons that we don't want, so basically anything away from zero degrees, we have a very nice collimation system, which I've kind of uh, under uh, represented here by just having a few gray boxes, but it's, it's a really, really beautiful collimation system, um, which uh, sends the neutron beam into the 30 meter long neutron tunnel. And the really nice thing about this is uh, this gets rid of any uh, lower energy neutrons or anything like that. So we end up with a, a very clean neutron system. So what we can do in this particular scenario is we, we can actually choose exactly what the uh, average energy is of our neutron beam by scanning the deuteron energy from 7.2 to 10 MeV. And we end up with around 5,000 neutrons per second with a, a, a spread of the neutron energy of around 200 keV. So these neutrons are then coming through the collimation system. And then inside of the tunnel is where we place the Texat TPC. And uh, it's placed around four meters from the target position just to really maximize the statistics. Because as I said before, this is a case where uh, every B mine counts and you don't want to lose it. So the neutrons are then flying inside of the Texat TPC. And uh, there are actually two different uh, reactions that we really care about for this particular setup. So the first is the neutron elastic scattering, uh, which is shown uh, here by the purple arrows. So when you get this populating the Hoyle state, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, we'll just see three alpha particles appear. They'll lose energy inside the gas. We'll pick that up inside the time projection chamber, and we'll be able to identify this event. But uh, one of the other very important things is actually normalization. So in order to understand exactly how many neutrons we sent through, in order to understand exactly what the cross-section is, because at the end of the day, that's what we really wanted to measure. We want to measure the cross-section at different energies. Uh, we have this CH2 target, which sits just inside of the TPC here. So uh, we'll also get events where a neutron comes in. You get elastic scattering off the, the hydrogen, the proton, in the CH2 target. And the proton then just flies straight through the detector and is actually picked up and triggered off one of these silicon detectors. And these have fairly high energies, so there's, there's no problem uh, triggering on this particular detector. And the uh, elastic scattering of neutrons off of uh, protons is incredibly well known. So we can use that to get our overall normalization. So we had all of this set up uh, ready to go. Uh, the first thing we wanted to do was actually demonstrate that we understand exactly what our neutron spectrum looked like. So in order to do this, what we did instead of placing Texad in the way is we had an NE213 detector uh, placed at 30 meters away at the end of the tunnel. 
And what we could do then is we can actually use, a, rather than a continuous beam, we used a pulse beam. So by measuring the time that it takes uh, from the beam arriving to the target to the neutron hitting the NE213 detector, we can use this time of flight to actually work out what the energy distribution is of the neutrons. So this is what's shown in the bottom here. And you can see that there's uh, a slightly uh, funky shape. This isn't just a normal um, Gaussian distribution of uh, neutron energies. And uh, this is really just because of the energy loss in the gas. It's not a statistical process. And the, so the data are shown in magenta um, from the NET13 detector. And we actually performed some iterative time corrections because even though eight centimeters over a length of 30 meters doesn't seem like a lot, uh, if you don't do these iterative corrections to account for the uh, different uh, flight paths from either the start of the gas cell to the end of the gas cell, it doesn't give quite a good agreement as we've shown here. And then overlaid with this in blue is uh, the results from a GEON simulation that I ran. And we can see that we have a pretty good agreement. So we felt fairly confident that we understand exactly what's going on with our neutron production. Okay. So uh, we actually ran this experiment in uh, March of 2020. Uh, we uh, were very lucky to have someone at Cub and uh, write a Scientific American article all about this. And we we're feeling very happy. And then if you cash your mind back to what was going on in March 2020, uh, we actually, I think we had this experiment canceled while we were there about four times. Um, and eventually COVID reared its ugly head. And eventually we had no choice but to actually evacuate back to Texas. And uh, the Texas TPC was actually sat in the tunnel halfway through the experiment for five months until we could return and finish. So that was uh, a bit sad, but it gave me a bit of a chance to uh, get started on the analysis. Okay, so we actually managed to go back and finish the experiment in uh, August of 2020. And uh, what we started to do then was uh, go through and look at these 3D pictures of exactly what's going on event by event. So here's an example of what a Hoyle event looks like when it's inside of the TPC. So the beam is actually flying left to right as the arrow is showing and our neutrons are not gonna be losing any energy because they're not charged in the gas. So we don't see the neutron beam, which is actually quite nice. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere, we see these three arms corresponding to alpha particles, which travel you know, 20, 25 millimeters uh, inside of the gas and then they just stop. And this is, uh, you know, you see a track like this and by eye, you can be like, yeah, okay, that, that sure looks like a three alpha particle event. Um, but it turns out actually getting a computer to know exactly what it should be looking for is a classic, you know, machine vision problem. Something that's very easy for humans to do is actually fairly difficult. Um, so what we really want to do then is we want to get the physics out of this cloud of points in 3D space. So one thing that we can do in this particular scenario is we can actually start to look at the invariant mass spectrum. So the invariant mass, for those who don't know, is where we get some idea of what the excitation energy of a nucleus is by looking at the breaker products. So here we have uh, the carbon-12 in the Hoyle state. It's breaking apart into three alpha particles. So what we can actually do is we can use the conservation of momentum. We kind of build those three alpha particles back together and say, OK, we have to conserve momentum. You know, that's a law of physics. What was the excitation energy of the carbon-12? And the reason that we want to do this is we really want to make sure that what we're actually populating is the Hoyle state in carbon-12, which has an excitation energy of 7.65. So on the left, um, we actually uh, simulated a variety of different reaction channels, which I'll come to in a second. Um, but the blue is the, the one of interest for the Hoyle state. And you can see that when we look at our experimental data, that's exactly what we see. We see the peak in the right situation. So by selecting events which are inside this peak, we can be very sure that they're actually arising from the oil states. Okay, so all we need to do in that particular scenario is we go through all of our data and for our various different neutron energies, we want to look at how many neutrons we produced, which if you recall, we get from looking at the elastic scattering from the CH2 foil. We want to look at how many oil events we have, which we get by you know, looking for events where we get these three tridents of alpha particles arising out of nowhere, and we reconstruct them and they make the Hoyle states. And then uh, with a bit of, you know, taking into account the target density, all we need to do then is just convert that into the cross section. So what we have in the plot here are our uh, results. So uh, as we change the different neutron energies, our results in blue show how the cross section is changing. So the threshold for the reaction is actually shown by the red line here. 
and uh, we actually went right down to the threshold just to make sure there was no funny business, some sort of weird near threshold uh, reaction. And actually, we went below the threshold as well, just to make sure that there wasn't some other possible source of uh, three alpha particles coming from somewhere. Um, and we didn't see any events, so we just had enough limits. And what we can start to do now is we can compare our data in blue with the house effects has a fetchback predictions that uh, Mary Beard and collaborators had in the in the magenta. And immediately, it seems very obvious that uh, with the house of fetchback prediction, as soon as you cross over the threshold, expects this very rapid rise in, um, in the cross section, which kind of just keeps increasing and increasing. What we see experimentally is that the situation is very different. You sort of creep above the threshold, and it's it's uh, you know kind of uh, 0.5 MeV in neutron energy before you start to see any real increase um, in the cross section. And rather than just being very smooth, what we see is that uh, you see this peak shape here, and this is coming back again. And what uh, this is actually evidence of is the presence of a resonance. So as soon as I got these results and I pulled them out, I was like. Hey, that kind of looks very familiar. Uh, and what I actually did is I overlaid the carbon 12 N alpha cross section scale down. And you can see that it peaks in roughly the same place. So, what this is really showing us is that when we have this uh, inelastic scattering to the uh, Hoyle state, what we're really doing is we're having the carbon 12 plus neutron system. We're making carbon 13, and then we're going through the compound nucleus and then ending up with a neutron plus the Hoyle state because of the overlap of these two things. So there's obviously some relatively strong carbon 12 plus neutron states sitting around here. OK, so this is not the only reaction with the three alpha particle final state, though. Um, so we need to be careful because uh, there is also the carbon 12 N alpha reaction. So you have carbon 12 come in on a uh, car carbon 12 plus a neutron. It splits out an alpha particle. Um, but what you can actually have is you can have the beryllium 9 a uh, heavy fragment being left in an excited state. So if this is not in the ground state, then that's actually enough that it would then decay into alpha, alpha, neutron. So you end up with three alpha particles in this particular scenario as well. And if we uh, come back to this plot here, then this is really one of the key points of doing this excitation um, energy and carbon-12 uh, measurements, because these other reactions can be well separated because they're not part of the peak here. Um, and this is actually only one of the, one cuts that we make. Again, by eye, they look completely different. And event by event, you can sort of categorize them and say, you know, this is this is Hoyle, this is carbon 12 N alpha. And you look at the excitation spectrum and it's you get it right every time. Um, so we also managed to actually extract um, this cross section as well. OK, so what we want to do now, we've actually managed to measure the, um, the cross section of various different neutron energies. Um, but uh, due to the dominance of the compound nucleus, what we can actually do is we can st start to understand a little bit more about exactly what is going on here. So the way that we can do this is by understanding, as I said, the resonance in carbon-13. So the next step was uh, performed a multi-channel R matrix fit. So there's a variety of very good data that are out there um, in conjunction with our data in blue. So we have elastic scattering and N0. We have inelastic scattering to the first excited state. Uh, we have the N alpha 0. And there's also a data set on beryllium 9 alpha N2. So this is populating the Hoyle state plus a neutron. Um, and the real aim for this was that we've actually maybe been able to measure the N0 to N2, so going from the ground state to the Hoyle state. But if you recall, there are actually two different mechanisms that are important. We want to understand the interplay between the Hoyle state and the ground state, but also the interplay between the Hoyle state and the two plus states. And actually, by performing this um, multi channel R matrix fit, we can actually get the carbon 12 N1, N2 cross section, which is actually impossible to measure experimentally because you would need to. Uh, send neutrons at a, a carbon 12 when it's in the two plus excited state, but this lasts you know, an absolute fraction of a second. And then what we can do is we can uh, infer uh, their inverses through the detail balance. OK, uh, so for those who aren't familiar with the compound nucleus reactions or the R matrix, all we really want to do is we look at these various different ways that we can actually form this compound nucleus of carbon 13. And by understanding how for instance, you build uh, carbon-13 from a neutron plus carbon-12 in the ground state or an alpha plus beryllium-9, 
This allows you to uh, sort of phenomenologically fit the cross sections and understand exactly what's going on in the system. So these are just some examples of the multi-channel R matrix fit um, for the various different channels. And we managed to get a very good uh, fit overall. Um, so what we could do now is we have the cross sections. We can uh, then take those cross sections as a function of different energies. And we want to understand the role of the Hoyle to the ground state transition, but also the Hoyle to the two plus transition. And when we look at the influence that this actually has on the enhancement of the upscattering, what we actually see is that there's a 2j plus one spin factor. Um, so when we go from the ground state to the Hoyle state, this j is zero, but for it's obviously two for a two plus state. So what we actually see is that the neutron upscattering de-excitation from the Hoyle state to the two plus state is actually a factor of five more important purely just due to the spin factor. And this is the one that we had to get through this multi-channel R matrix fit. So that's, that's kind of what, that what was very nice that we were able to extract that as well. So what we need to do then is uh, we put our uh, experimentally obtained cross sections into this. We uh, do an integration and then we compare our results. So this is what we see as our final results. So on the x-axis, we're changing the temperatures and seeing what effects this has on the triple alpha reaction rate. I just reminded this recent rate enhancement is saying you take the standard uh, triple alpha reaction rate without any sort of upscattering, by what factor does it increase when you have these either neutrons or protons at a density of 10 to the six grams per cubic centimeter. So first of all, in green, we have from the Hoyle state to the ground state, Obviously, because the cross-section is a lot smaller, this, this uh, rate enhancement factor is no longer going to be a factor of 200 or something of very small temperatures. You see that it uh, really doesn't play a very large role uh, at all. And then what we also see here is we see in black from the Hoyle state to the two plus states. And as, we, uh, as I explained just before, this 2j plus one spin factor means that this one is actually more important. So even though the cross sections can be kind of comparable, the actual rate enhancement factor is, um, is more important for the, for, the zero, for the Hoyle to the two plus. And if we add these together, then the total rate enhancement from both of these is shown by the dotted blue line. And what we can actually do is we can compare this to the, uh, the same from the uh, Beard paper of the sum for the proton upscattering enhancements. And you see that they're you know, roughly the same, really. Um, you know, there's maybe a factor of two at some temperatures, but no longer is this the scenario where at very small temperatures, we have this, huge, this expectation of a huge enhancement of the triple alpha reaction rate. Okay, so moving forward to the conclusions. So TechSat is a general purpose time projection chamber capable of measuring different reaction mechanisms. And what we wanted to do was study the role of neutron inelastic scattering to the Hoyle states. And by measuring the cross section of this reaction, it informs us about the time reverse astrophysical case. And the question that we really wanted to answer was whether this neutron upscattering enhances the triple alpha reaction rate by a significant amount. Along the way, this was the, actually the first instance of a neutron induced measurement with an active target time projection chamber. And what we saw is that near the threshold, experimentally, we saw a much smaller cross-section as compared to the house of Feshbach calculations. So this rate enhancement is heavily suppressed versus what we previously thought. So the answer, therefore, is really that the neutron upscattering is not quite as important as we first expected. And there's also a question of astrophysical sites here. You know, 10 to the 6 grams per cubic centimeter, uh, per cubic centimeter is a very high neutron density by itself. Um, so you have to think about what kind of scenarios you can have where these uh, conditions are going to present themselves. And uh, we published these, uh, this result last year with Nature. And you can also start thinking about uh, similar effects in other systems. So for instance, can neutron upscattering boost the carbon-12 alpha-gamma reaction? So here we have a 9.59 MeV1 minus resonance. So because this is an even-even nucleus, this is an isis, ISIS spin suppressed E1 gamma transition. So if you have neutron upscattering there, it's going to once again enhance the radiative decay uh, possibilities. So this may actually play some uh, a role in a very similar way to the carbon-12 alpha gamma reaction, which of course is also hugely interesting. So with that, I'd just like to thank all of the collaborators and uh, everyone who helped out on the experiments. 
uh, thank the funding agencies and thank you all of you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. It was a very nice talk.